Welcome to Marx 213. Marx's articles titled Debates on the Law on Thefts of Wood and published in the Rheinitze Zeitung in October and November of 1842 were fetish texts among critical legal scholars, critical sociologists, Marxist historians, and radical lawyers during the late 1960s and 1970s. The articles do not typically appear in the canon of Marx's political writings. They are absent, for instance, from the classic exhaustive American compendium, The Marx-Engels Reader, edited by Robert C. Tucker. They are considered by some, following Louis Althusser, as still tainted by the liberal rationalist moment of Marx's useful, youthful writings. They even predate, by a few months, Marx's engagement with Hegel's philosophy of right and his attacks on the left Hegelians. The articles don't figure in the typical bibliography of political, philosophical, and economic writings. But Marx's 1842 articles were a touchstone for a set of critical thinkers in law, history, sociology, and radical lawyers during the 1970s. They upended criminology, creating a whole new flank of critical criminologist, and nourished a body of Marxist historiography. And for good cause, Marx's articles captured succinctly the violence and the brutality of the struggle between landowners and the poor in 19th century Germany. They revealed how the criminal law and punishment could be instrumentalized by the wealthy to dispossess the downtrodden they showed the violence of capital accumulation. They represented Marx's first foray in the domain of material interests. And in, this, in his own words, they, quote, gave me the first impulse to take up the study of economic questions. In the 1970s, Marxist historians and critical sociologists and lawyers would do precisely that work, layer the political economy, critical legal theory, and critical criminology onto the work that Marx had begun in 1842 with his blistering critique of how the Rhine provincial legislators had turned a customary privilege of the poor, which was gleaning wood in the forest, including on private and communal properties, how they had turned that into a crime and used it to impose forced labor on the poor to work under peonage conditions uh, on the roads and property of the landed gentry. The British social historians, E.P. Thompson, Peter Linbaugh, and the group that collectively assembled the classic work Albion's Fatal Tree, Crime and Society in English in 18th Century England, published in 1975, um, those social historians, including Douglas Hay, returned to Marx's articles on the thefts of wood to nourish their analysis of class struggle uh, over the exploitation of forests, of poaching, uh, of the Black Act, uh, of the development of capitalism in the 18th century. Peter uh, Linbau uh, wrote extensively on Marx's articles. In Italy, the pioneer radical criminologist Dario Melosi marshaled Marx's articles to help spark a new strand of Marxist criminology in landmark work, including his notable essay, The Penal Question in Capital, which was published in 1976. Um, other critical common criminologists as well would draw on Marx's articles to deconstruct the category of crime. In France, the renowned critical jurist and penologist Pierre Lascombe edited and presented the Marx articles in a classic volume titled Marx du vol de bois à la critique du droit, from the theft of woods to the critique of law and rights. Uh, he did that with the Frankfurt professor Hartwig Zander. And the critical legal scholar Michael Zifaras published a significant treatment of the article uh, in an article called Marx, Justice et Jurisprudence. In the legal academy in the United States, Marx's articles on the thefts of wood became a reference point within critical legal studies, uh, a movement in law that brought together strands of critical and social theory, structuralism, and post-structuralism uh, starting in the 1970s. You get a good sense of this when Duncan Kennedy, one of the founders uh, of uh, critical legal studies, recounts the history of the movement and refers to Marx's 1984 articles basically as a, as a legal category on, them, on their own. 
uh, Kennedy is describing the first uh, Critical Legal Studies Conference in 1977. It's a remarkable interview, definitely worth reading. And gets to the intervention of Michael Tiger, uh, who still today is a radical criminal defense attorney um, and at the time was a Marxist law professor at the University of Texas in Austin. Ten Kennedy, Duncan Kennedy, describes Tiger's invention at the CLS conference in 1977 in the following terms. He crashed the meeting and gave not a labor theory of value speech, but a Marxist theft of wood anticipates everything that the modern leftist can think of, and it is really the working class that counts speech. Uh, he was wearing cowboy boots and a cowboy shirt and represented, again, a totally radical 60s thing. His message was basically, you assholes don't even know what class struggle or class violence is. Within critical legal circles in the 1970s, Marx's writings on the thefts of wood were precisely the reference point for the brutality of class warfare. Marx had specifically used the category of class throughout the articles, describing how the legislators, in his words, would raise their class itself to the real possibility uh, of enjoying its rights. Uh, his commentators in the 1970s would use the articles to thrust crime and punishment back into the spotlight and the heart of Marx's thought. Crime returned to the foreseen. Crime which as Peter Limbaugh remarked, was capital's most ancient tool in the creation and control of the working class. Michel Foucault was steeped in these debates, especially the debates among the historians, um, particularly when he turned in 1973 to explore the construction of the category of the delinquent, the concept of the delinquent, uh, and to explore disciplinary power in his lectures at the Collège de France, the Punitive Society. The year before, in his lectures on penal theories and institutions, Foucault had dedicated the first half of his teaching, so the first half of the year, to a detailed analysis of the Nupier Rebellion in Normandy in 1639 and to its repression by Richelieu and the Chancelier Seguier. Foucault had negotiated the querulous territory of the historians, the vast literature on 17th century popular uprisings, including the quarrels between uh, one of the leading French historians of the Ancien Regime at the time, uh, Roland Mounier, uh, and the Soviet historian Boris Porchnev, a specialist of French popular uprisings during the period 1623-1648. Uh, that was the topic of um, uh, his dissertation, actually. Foucault read and admired uh, the English historians also, uh, certainly the historians uh, surrounding E.P. Thompson. And immersed in this literature, Foucault threw himself into studying the birth of the penitentiary uh, and what he would call the punitive society. In those lectures in 1973, Marx's articles on the theft of wood would serve as a stepping stone for Foucault to develop his theory of illégalisme populaire. Um, I will translate the term illégalisme as illegalisms and uh, not illegalities. That's an important point. I'll get to it when I um, describe his theory of illegalisms. But the important point is that they're not turned yet into illegalities or something that is decidedly illegal or criminal. It's the struggle over that space. In any event, Foucault developed his theories of uh, uh, illegalisms and his analysis of the subjectivation of the delinquent subject, his discussion of the development of 19th century theories of the criminal as social enemy, his genealogy of the birth in conversation with the work, or the historical work and Marx's article uh, on the thefts of wood and the repression of uh, peasants and uh, peasant uprisings. Foucault had read Marx's articles closely and annotated them as a student. His fiche de lecture uh, on Marx's articles are in the archives at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, and they're available online. I've actually put a link to them uh, on the website so you can actually see his, his writings, his notes, the notes he took. 
um, is the handwriting suggests to me at least that he wrote them in the 1950s. Several years later, on January 24, 1973, in those lectures on the punitive society, Foucault would refer back to Marx's articles and underscore how the emergence of the theory of the criminal as social enemy in the 19th century had to, in his words, take into account what Marx wrote regarding the discussion of the theft of wood. Uh, and both there and in Discipline and Punish, Foucault formulates a theory of illegalisms uh, that built on uh, Marx's critique uh, in those articles and other work. Um, in, in that work, Foucault actually pushes uh, Marx's text in a uniquely productive direction, proposing new ways to think of power and focusing our attention on the way in which these acts of resistance and their repression shape the subjectivities of the poor and the privileged at the time. Now, other brilliant contemporary thinkers would pick up these strands and push them further. The critical theorist and anthropologist James C. Scott built on Marx and Foucault to develop a theory of what he called infrapolitics, um, those struggles from below, uh, what he called the ordinary acts of resistance from people at the margins of society. Other critical theorists built on the decoupling of crime and punishment present in Marx, Foucault, and others, uh, for instance, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois or uh, George Rusch and Otto Kirchheimer, uh, the early Angela Davis, George Jackson and others, they would build on those, uh, uh, de that decoupling of crime and punishment to argue for penal abolition. In fact, one can almost draw a straight line from these thinkers to the present and to the powerful abolitionist movement today and the writings of abolitionists, especially feminist abolitionists, uh, including Angela Davis, uh, Mariam Kaba, Dorothy Roberts, Sarah Haley, Derricka Purnell, and others. As these different strands make clear, there are several dimensions or directions in which Marx's 1984 text and its receptions can be pushed today to nourish forward-looking projects and praxis. I'm going to talk about four. First, Marx's uh, 1842 articles and their receptions could stimulate further work on forms of social control exercised by the state and parts of society, especially through the criminal law and punishment. This is the top-down dimension, the way in which the criminal law is instrumentalized and deployed, the way that punishment, for instance, serves to enforce a racial hierarchy by perpetuating racialized mass incarceration today, or a sexual hierarchy by targeting transgender persons. Along this dimension, we can develop new critiques uh, and practices of resistance to state and social apparatuses uh, and interrogate how they interact with political economic developments, as in theories of neoliberal penality, racial capitalism, or labor and surplus population theories like the earlier Rusch and Kirchheimer hypotheses. We can interrogate how the criminal law serves to justify or entrench social hierarchies and what role legal ideologies or regimes of truth might play. Second, Marx's uh, 1842 articles and their reception can stimulate further work on forms of resistance by those who are most impacted by inequality, precarity, and oppression. This is the bottom-up dimension. It allows us to identify forms of resistance where we typically do not, where we usually see only domination. Uh, this is what James C. Scott did with his notion of hidden transcripts. Um, along this dimension, we could explore how the self-understanding or self-consciousness of resistance is shaped, what some refer to as questions of subjectivity, subjectification, and desubjectification. We can identify and investigate how people can be interpolated, not just by the police, as Juzer proposed, but by protest, resistance, and mobilization. We can trace the histories and the historical trajectories of the modern concept of revolution, of uprisings or riots or political disobedience, uh, of uh, uh, zads and tazes, temporary autonomous zones, and other practices of protest and social movements. Uh, and we can do that both in theory and in practice. 
Third, Marx's 1842 articles and their reception served to break the link between crime and punishment, opening up new horizons for a world without punishment over the possibility of replacing the punitive paradigm with a paradigm of cooperation. This dimension leads inexorably to the abolitionist movement today and the organizing that is being conducted by feminist, anti-capitalist, and anti-ableist abolitions now. Now, in addition to these three spatial dimensions, there is the fourth dimension of time. Uh, Marx's 1842 articles pose the question of the historical trajectory, the sequencing, the continuities or disruptions uh, of popular uprisings. Along this dimension, we can explore whether and how uh, those rebellions contributed to revolutionary change, whether they were continuous or discontinuous, and how important they were to history, or how they changed form over time, as in Josh Clover's work in Riot Strike Riot, um, which is looking at different ways in which protest manifests. Uh, this was the terrain, uh, of course, of those quarrels between uh, Mounier, Porchnev, and others, and they have become of increasing relevance today uh, with ongoing recurring movements like Occupy Wall Street, um, Nuit Debout, Black Lives Matter, Penal Abolition, the MAGA movement today, and others. Along all four of those mentions, rereading Marx, Foucault, and those who built on their work provides markers and guideposts to help understand our present. Um, and they nourish forms of resistance to the punitive society, the state, and behemoth capitalism. These texts point us forward towards a future in which we might be able to, once and for all, dethrone the punishment paradigm and replace it with cooperation. Let me provide here some background elements to provide context for the seminar. Uh, first, on the publication of Marx's articles. So it was in October and November 1842 that Marx published a series of five articles commenting on the debates in the Rhine Provincial Assembly uh, from May 23 to July 25, 1841. Uh, debates over the proposed and enacted law criminalizing the gathering of wood, including dead wood, from private and communal forests. The articles were published on October 25th, 27th, and 30th, and then November 1st and 3rd, 1842, in the Rheinische Zeitung, which in English is the Rhenish Gazette, under the pen name a Rhinelander. At the time, Marx was 24 years old, and he was the editor-in-chief of the Gazette, uh, which operated from 1842 to 1843. As C.P. Dutt, an editor of Marx and Engels notes, uh, the Gazette was founded by Rhenish radical bourgeois. Uh, Marx was one of the main contributors to the Gazette. And as he writes, from October 42 to the end of the year, Marx was its editor-in-chief under his leadership, the Gazette adopted a revolutionary democratic policy and ultimately was suppressed by the Prussian government at the end of March 1843. During this period, Marx was also contributing uh, to uh, another uh, a journal, uh, the German Annals of Science and Art. Uh, those had been founded and were edited and published by Arnold Rüge and Ernst Theodor Echtemeyer, who were young Hegelians and those published from 41 to 43 in Leipzig. Now, in his short intellectual autobiography in the preface of a contribution to the critique of political economy in 1849, Marx attributed to these articles on the theft of woods uh, two things, actually. First, uh, they pushed him to address tangible questions of material interests, um, and he he actually speaks about it in an embarrassing way. It was, it was the first time he really got to know uh, material interests, he says. And the second is that it made him recognize the need to study political economy. In his words, it gave me the first impulse to take up the study of the economic questions. Frederick Engels, looking back at the articles in 1888, um, suggested that they signaled a sharpening of the political struggles 
against the Prussian state, um, still mostly, though, under the veil of a philosophical uh, dispute. Now let's turn to the debate on the, the law of the theft of, thefts of wood uh, themselves, um, those five articles. In the five articles, Marx critiques a law adopted by the Rhine Provincial Assembly in, on June 17, 1841, which defined the crime of theft of wood um, and defined it as a crime rather than as a misdemeanor or as a violation and defined it to include the taking without permission of any live or dead wood in a private or communal forest or at any point of transfer outside of the forest. Under customary norms at the time and for centuries, poor persons gleaned dead wood in the forests for their survival. They used it to heat themselves for shelter and to sell to make money. This legislation in 1841 turned that privilege into a crime punishable by a hefty fine, restitution, and forced labor. In the series of articles, Marx makes the following six points. First, and perhaps foremost, that the Rhine province legislatures were turning legal behavior into crimes and meeting out severe punishments to benefit the financial interests of the class of landed property owners. They were not just appropriating more property, which they were, uh, the dead wood, for instance, that could previously have been gleaned, and, and also uh, the property of the, of the trees, nor simply compensating uh, the landowners for the loss of this new form of property in dead wood, which they also did with a restitutionary fee and a separate fine, nor just imposing punitive damages, which they were as well, oftentimes multiple fold, the value of the wood, they were extracting free labor under punitive conditions from the poor by forcing them into penal labor to work for the landed property owners, a form of surplus punishment and surplus value. The provision regarding forced labor provided as follows. In the Rhine province, the competent forest owner should be authorized to hand over convicted persons to the local authority to perform penal labor in such a way that their working days will be put to the account of the manual services on communal roads which the forest owner is obliged to render in the rural community and accordingly subtracted from, his, from this obligation. This, of course, was pure windfall for the landed property owners. In addition, that is, to the restitutionary value of the wood, punitive fines in multiples, and a special sum. Not only that, but as Marx emphasized, the fines were to be paid to the forest owners. So in effect, the landed property owners got the free labor, and they were also got the proceeds. They were allowed to, in Marx's terms, purloin the state itself. Marx called it a lottery, winning a prize, a pure source of income. Now, the legislatures, legislators were essentially creating crimes out of whole cloth, uh, re redefining civil notions of property and producing a brutal form of convict leasing. I use the term advisedly there was a family resemblance that W.E.B. Du Bois himself recognized with the violent and brutality uh, of convict leasing schemes in the South immediately following the end of the Civil War, described in Black Reconstruction in America. Uh, now, uh, as Michael Zifaras shows, Marx's text combined an analysis of penal and civil law. The criminalization amounted at the same time to a redefinition of the law of property, uh, which was a civil matter. The legislature's actions on the penal side went hand in hand with the emergence of a capitalist market in wood. Now, as part of this first contribution of the articles, Marx critiques a number of elements of the new law and of the hypocrisy of the legislatures, including 
the conflict of interest in allowing the forester who works for and is paid by the land property owner to set the value of the dead wood, um, since he, of course, had every interest in setting that value as high as possible. Two, the conflict of interest in allowing the landed property owners to enforce laws that resulted in the free forced labor of the poor on the property of the landed gentry, um, and that everything being paid to those landowners. Uh, in addition, the additional conflict of interest in allowing the landowners full discretion to the set the tenure of employment of the forester who enforced the prohibitions and set the value of the gleaned wood. Fourth, the way in which the public servant, the burgomaster, who owes a fiduciary duty to all of the people of the community, uh, was turned into the private taskmaster and executor for the individual landowners. Fifth, the contradiction of legislators who are supposed to have the interest of all citizens in mind, legislating on behalf of a segment of the citizens only, the wealthy and privileged. Sixth, the double standard of carefully distinguishing between, for instance, axes and saws, which they do in the, in the, in the debates, but ignoring any distinction between fallen and growing wood. And finally, the failure to engage in any proportionality analysis of the harm done. Marx offered a visceral critique of the social and political construction of crime. In an acerbic tone, Marx wrote, you should have called it murder of wood and punished it as murder. Of course, his point was that the legislature was making things up out of whole cloth, uh, inventing a crime, and had the power to do what it wanted with the law. Uh, Marx insisted that the, quote, law is not exempt from the general obligation to tell the truth, but if the law applies the term theft to an action that is scarcely even a violation of forest regulations, then the law lies and the poor are sacrificed to a legal lie. Marx also warned of the consequences of this corruption. He suggested that it would shape the understanding and the behavior of poor people in, in their subjectivities, that is, and possibly lead them to question laws more generally. Um, he would write that the people sees the punishment, but it does not see the crime. And because it sees punishment where there is no crime, it will see no crime where there is punishment. By applying the category of theft where it ought not to be applied, you have also exonerated it where this category ought to be applied. Uh, tricky little passage that I'll come back to. Second, uh, Marx developed a critical theory of law, or actually several. The articles were, of course, a critique of the role of law in capitalist development. They would prove to be a gold mine for later critical legal theorists who wanted to explore how the criminal law was instrumentalized and deployed, whether it served as superstructural or ideological, or served a more basic role uh, at the base, how it served to internalize power struggles and whether it could be turned back for purposes of resistance. Marx also developed a critical legal theory of universal customary rights. Um, he did so in the context of the legal remedy that he was proposing. Mm -hmm. Marx called for a customary right for the poor. Uh, in his words, we demand for the poor a customary right, and indeed one which is not of a local character but is a customary right of the poor in all countries, he wrote. We go still further, he added, and maintain that a customary right by its very nature can only be a right of this lowest propertyless and elemental mass. At a legal theoretic level, then, Marx's proposal was, um, well, was somewhat curious because customary rights tended to be understood as emanating from local customs at the regional or national level, and to be historically situated. Here, instead, Marx called for an internationalist customary right, universal as to the class of poor people in all countries, uh, in other words, exclusive to them because of their condition in the social order. As Zifaras has shown, Marx placed himself in a delicate position between the historical school of jurisprudence of Friedrich Karl von Savigny and the philosophical school of Hegel. Marx was charting new ground towards what Zifaras called 
a system of universal customary rights of poverty. Uh, he was developing, in Zifahasa's words, a truly universal science of law, a science of law of the people of every country. Of course, this is interesting, uh, particularly insofar as it represents a rejection of the historical school of jurisprudence of Savigny. Marx had written another article uh, between April and August of 1842 that was published just a few months before the articles on the thefts of wood. Uh, this other article was published on August 9th, 1842. Uh, in which Marx attacked the historical school and especially Gustave von Hugo. Uh, Hugo and Savigny were the uh, were real the, the founders of this school. Hugo was the Germanic branch uh, of the historical school, uh, basically suggesting that the, that Germanic tradition um, was what should be uh, the law of the land. By contrast, um, Savigny represented the more Romanist branch uh, looking at uh, Roman law. Uh, and of course in this context, in that article, uh, just published a few months before the law, the, the debates on the law and theft of woods, uh, Marx didn't mince his words either. He really attacked the uh, historical school directly saying the 18th century had only one product, the essential character of which is frivolity and this sole frivolous product is the historical school. So, um, so the, the article and the legal theory in the article is uh, addressed at uh, the historical school in part um, and develops this idea of universal customary rights for the poor. In some respects, the, the legal arguments are a bit imprecise or confused at times or contain different theories of law. Uh, there's a passage where Marx adopts a natural law concept of rights. Uh, he writes, for instance, that the law is the universal and authentic exponent of the legal nature of things. Uh, and, uh, and therefore that, he writes, the law must be regulated according to the legal nature of things. Die rechtliche Natur der Dinge. Uh, he speaks of the immortality of the law, uh, he, he writes that the state must guarantee the immortality of the law and cannot go against the nature of things. And of course, all of this smacks of natural law theory. It's very idealist and somewhat a priori. In other passages, Marx seems to have an intuitive, spiritualist conception of law. There's, for instance, a long passage where Marx likens the dead wood to the poor and seems to ground customary rights on that intuition uh, of a physical, social resemblance. At other times, Marx offers more of a straightforwardly conservative legal proposition, arguing for a return to earlier, uh, more legitimate customary rights under Germanic law and feudal codes. There's also a passage where Marx <clears throat> seems to refer to Proudhon's book, uh, what is Property, which had just been published in 1840. A uh, famous book, of course, where Proudhon answers that question, what is property, uh, with the expression, property is theft. Now, of course, Marx would ridic ridicule that proposition and, and that argument five years later in The Poverty of Philosophy, published in 1847. But nonetheless, here in 1842, Marx writes something quite similar. If every violation of property without distinction, without a more exact definition, is termed theft, will not all private property be theft? Uh, overall, Marx's remedy, uh, the idea of a customary right, appears somewhat legalistic, uh, an approach that he would come to reject swiftly. Uh, surely, he rejected it by 1843 when he publishes his article on the Jewish question in the deutsch Französische Jahrbuch. But these articles on the theft of wood predate that turn, uh, which also explains in part why they do not figure typically in the canon of his political writings. Third element, 
Marx develops a theory about the political implications of seemingly neutral forms of rationalization and administration. In discussing the tension from customary traditions to a system of objectively delineated rights, from a, from a condition of privileges to a system of rights, Marx shows how parsimony and simplification, how rationalization and modernization itself can have political effects. Reason is not neutral, one could say. Marx takes the case of the abolition of monasteries and their transition to private property and shows how, in that process of privatization, certain privileges that benefited the poor, for instance, the actual, the accidental support of the poor received from monastery life, they, those benefits simply fell by the wayside. The legal rights were regularized, private property was regularized, but the informal ties withered away. In his words, they were left out of consideration. Marx describes brilliantly how the earlier traditional arrangements involved a mixture of common property, public and private rights. They were hybrids, fuzzy at the edges. But in order to systematize matters with rights in the categories of Roman civil law, there is, Marx says, a one-sidedness that imposes orderliness and simplicity and in the process deprives the poor of their privileges. Marx emphasizes, it's a very realist analysis, that these are chosen results. It could have been just, just as possible to recognize occupation rights that would allow the poor to retain their benefits, like easements or rights of way on private property. The distortions and deprivations are not merely accidental, they are chosen, man-made. It's interesting to note, uh, incidentally, that Foucault was particularly interested in this aspect of Marx's articles. In his reading notes, Foucault jots down a header, uh, the role of reason, and notes, the role of reason is to render the world one-sided. He then cites the passage, uh, which is at page 233 of the English edition of Complete Works, and picking up especially the line, the character of a thing <clears throat> is a product of understanding. Now, in French, it translates as, as reason. The character of a thing is a product of reason uh, in French. And then Foucault continues, uh, after noting down the passage, he writes, from which there is the resulting contradiction. Reason has eliminated the ambiguity in the medieval con conception of property, partly private, partly public, Reason made it the privileges of the lords, but reduced the poor to misery. Of course, Foucault would likely have filed these annotations figuratively in his research on reason and madness. Uh, the fourth element. Marx develops a critique of the state uh, in these articles, which he will continue to work on in the succeeding months. He critiques the pretended neutrality and uh, representativeness of the state and legislature, uh, here the Rhine Provincial Assembly. Although the assembly was constituted of only three orders, the bourgeois, the landed gentry, and the nobility, uh, it was supposed to represent all citizens. Marx shows the lie and how, in fact, the deputies represent the interests of only the landed gentry. Of the assembly, Marx writes, they themselves are legally entrusted not only with the representation of particular interests, but also with the representation of the interests of the province. And however contradictory these two tasks may be, in case of conflict, there should not be a moment's delay in sacrificing representation of particular interests to representation of the interests of the province. In fact, he goes on to say, the sense of right and legality is the most important provincial characteristic of the Rhinelander. Of course, this is not what had occurred uh, as a result of the partiality of the assembly and the fact that it did not live up to those ideals of generality. But this was not an accident, he said. The assembly essentially fulfilled its mission, which was a one-sided mission. <clears throat> 
the fifth element, um, Marx began to study material interests, as he recalled in 1859. Now, much of the material anal analysis actually concerns uh, the material interests of the landed property owners. Uh, Marx referred specifically to the abject materialism of the privilege and, and the way in which the law promoted, without reason or morality, uh, their material interests. Um, it's the material analysis that makes these articles such a powerful demonstration of the violence and brutality of class warfare. The binary struggle of the political struggle uh, between the landed property owners, or what he called the privileged class, and the poor and downtrodden, who he referred to as the poor class, is striking this early in his writings. Finally, uh, the sixth element, and perhaps one of the most important, at least to me, uh, Marx deconstructed the conventional liberal theoretic link between crime and punishment. Uh, the couple that crime and punishment, uh, since the Enlightenment at least, uh, lies at the core of the Western liberal imagination. Uh, in the liberal tradition, crime is what triggers punishment, and punishment is limited to preventing or remedying crime. The legitimacy of that relationship founds the liberal state. It grounds the philosophical and juridical discourse of crime and punishment from Hobbes and Locke uh, through Cesare Beccaria to John Stuart Mill and John Rawls. But what Marx showed is that crime is not what calls for punishment. It is profit and self-interest that calls for punishment. Marx severed the link between crime and punishment, thereby, at times, denaturalizing crime. This is something that many critical thinkers would continue to do after Marx, including Du Bois, Ruschen Kirchheimer, George Jackson, Angela Davis, Foucault, and today feminist abolitionist organizers. And I think you can draw a straight line through all this work, um, leading inexorably uh, to the abolitionist movement today. So that's the text, Marx's text. Let me now turn to its reception in the 1970s. As Peter Leinbow suggests in his article, Karl Marx, The Theft of Wood <clears throat> and Working Class Composition, radical thinkers returned to Marx's articles in the late 1960s and early 1970s <coughs> at a specific historical juncture. During the rise of urban riots, prison uprisings, and social unrest, the riots, or uprisings, in Watts, in Harlem, in Detroit and Newark, as well as the student revolts um, in Tunisia in 1967, and then around the world in 1968, in London, in Prague, in Berlin, of course in Paris in May 1968, all of those uprisings troubled the schema of Marxist revolution. As Linbo explains, the wide scope and extent of the uprisings often involving looting and theft, did not fit in the simple categories that Marxist thinkers had used to understand ephemeral eruptions, either as secondary to the workers' movement or as an outburst of the oppressed. Many crim crim critical sociologists and criminologists turned to Marx's articles on the thefts of wood to challenge the rigidity uh, within some Marxist circles over the concept of the lumpen proletariat. The Marxist tradition had contained conflicting strains on the question of crime. In Marx's writings, the matter of the lumpen proletariat had always been a delicate and controversial issue. But these articles on the theft of wood help make sense of the uprisings and of their repression. They help make sense of the politics of criminality and the criminality of politics. English social historians, especially E.P. Thompson, had studied earlier popular uprising and excavated their political and moral dimensions. Thompson argued that the uprisings of people in the 18th century, which had been characterized by early historians as mere riots or desperation, were in fact political actions born of moral indignation at the exploitation and impoverishment that were accompanying the historical transformation of political economy the enclosures, privatization of the commons, uh, 
supposed liberalization of the markets, mechanization, and eventually industrialization, industrialization of the economy. There was, Thompson argued, a moral economy to the riots in England. Others in Thompson's circle, like Peter Leinbau, focused on the criminological dimensions, turning back to Marx's articles and exploring the timing and circumstances of the gleaning of wood, of the, of the violations of the enforcement uh, of the new prohibitions, and of course the extent of uh, the behaviors. Leinbau revealed that, quote, the real dangers in the forest before the revolution of 1848 were those that a mass movement for the appropriation of forest wealth placed upon capitalist accumulation. And he recounted the statistics. In 1836, of a total of 207,478 prosecutions brought forward in Prussia, a full 150,000, 100,000, were against wood pilfering and other forest offenses. So basically, three quarters of the 200,000 prosecutions were for wood pilfering and other forest offenses. In Baden, in 1836, <clears throat> there was one conviction of wood stealing for every 6.1 inhabitants, he writes. In 1841, there was a conviction for every 4.6 inhabitants, and in 1842, one for every four. One out of every four inhabitants had a conviction for wood stealing. Now, turning to Michel Foucault and his theory of illegalisms. Foucault uh, is immersed in these debates when, uh, in his lectures on the punitive society in 1973, he develops a theory of what he calls illegalisms. Uh, and when he pronounces, uh, in his words, we cannot understand the operation of a penal system a system of laws and prohibitions if we do not examine the positive functioning of illegalisms. Now, Foucault had just finished the year before in his lectures on penal theories and institutions at the Collège de France, uh, 1972, um, an intense uh, semester-long investigation of the Nupier rebellions, uh, the barefoot uh, rebellions uh, and the repression in 1638 uh, that had taken place in Normandy. And he was now turning his focus uh, to the birth of the penitentiary system. It's in that context that Foucault argued that social relations in the post-revolutionary period in France, uh, 1825, say, to 1848, that social relations during that period approximated a social war, he said a social war that was best understood through the lens of civil war. Foucault proposed a model of civil war as a foil to Hobbes's war of all against all, but he also wanted to distinguish this model of the civil war from Marx's class warfare and Clausewitz's war as the continuation of politics. Clausewitz was easy because Foucault could invert the formula so that politics became the continuation of war by other means. The relation to Marx was far more complicated, especially because when he introduced the social war in 1973, Foucault referred to it as, quote, the war of rich against poor, of owners against those who have nothing, of bosses against proletarians. Now, the question of Foucault's relationship to Marx is fraught, of course, uh, and, and, and extremely productive, um, and it has generated a, <clears throat> a wide range of remarkable work, far more copious uh, to, that I could summarize or refer to here. <clears throat> in March 1313, we will return to this question often and bring in specialists on the question, such as Matteo Poleri, who just completed his dissertation on the topic. Uh, in this part, I will simply 
return to Foucault's theory of illegalism, illegalism, illegalisms, as a way to immerse us in the substance of Foucault's work and its relation to Marx. I've previously described the theory uh, at length on several occasions, so I'm going to be brief here, and uh, there are citations to the other treatments, the longer treatments, uh, in the written introduction. Now, as I mentioned, in 1973, <clears throat> Foucault proposes a model of civil war to understand social relations. The terrain of that civil war was the nebulous and hazy line that separated legal from illegal conduct. Under the Ancien Régime, the merchants and bourgeois engaged in widespread illegalisms against the monarchy, minimizing their crops, selling them green, skirting the rules to avoid greater levies, and of course, the popular classes did as well. Uh, by illegalisms, Foucault had in mind actions that were in a gray area, potentially criminalizable, uh, but often unenforced, sometimes unseen. They were not yet illegalities because they had not necessarily yet been turned into crimes or convictions or punishments. They were in a gray zone uh, at the border. In fact, the whole struggle was whether they would be criminalized and punished or allowed to happen. And that's why um, I, in, in the translation, I want to keep a, a clear demarcation between illegalisms, which are not yet punished, right, and illegalities, which are crimes uh, that are punished. Um, this isn't always done. It's it's not done in the in our existing translation of discipline and punish. Um, but for purposes here, I'll make that distinction. I'll keep those separate. Now, after the revolution, Foucault argues, those illegalisms continue unabated by by the popular class and by the bourgeois. But the popular illegalisms become a source of social struggle as the merchant class and landowners begin to recharacterize them as theft, deceit, and larceny of what was now their private property. The contestations over these illegalisms uh, lead to the moralization of the behaviors of the popular classes as the privileged attack them for being lazy and drunken, effectively stealing their money by stealing their time. Right? Uh, uh, since since they were now on wage, on, on hourly wages, say, being lazy was a theft of property, uh, according to the privileged classes. And this would lead seamlessly, uh, Foucault argues, uh, to the birth of the penitentiary. Uh, the struggle over illegalisms and the comportment and the behaviors of uh, the popular classes uh, would would give birth to the prison um, and disciplinary power. Um, in a fictitious dialogue in the punitive society um, between the popular classes and the privilege, Foucault asked on behalf of the popular classes to the privileged, what, what has changed? Uh, he's, he writes, did we not violate the law, plunder wealth together? under the Ancien Régime, that is, to which the privileged respond, that was under the Ancien Régime. And at that time, both the popular classes and the privileged were all fighting against, quote, rules, laws, and unjustifiable abuses, of course, by the monarchy. And it was a question of power and so of politics, whereas now things, property, and common law, natural law, is being attacked. Previously, abuses of power, of monarchical power, were attacked. Now, violations of law and our private property displays a lack of morality. Um, in his manuscript, he didn't actually deliver this, but in his manuscript, Foucault ends this dialogue with a marvelous exclamation. Allez, 
et faites pénitence. Go and do your penance. Right? Go and do your penance, which, of course, is the, is, the, is, the, is the immediate link to the birth of the penitentiary. Uh, in this passage, Foucault then declares, it is at this point that the pinning of the system of moral correction on the penal system takes place. Thus, Calhoun says, it is however ardently to be hoped that the period is fast approaching when the suggestions offered in subsequent chapters may tend to accelerate the renovation of this forlorn and miserable class of outcast criminals by means of an appropriate penitentiary system. Uh, Colquhoun was one of the founders of the, of the, uh, of the police function uh, in England. Now this is what gives birth then to the prison, uh, to, to disciplinary power, and to the concept of the criminal as social enemy, a concept that would animate the political landscape and struggles of the 19th century, the calls for order and discipline, the dominant criminological theories at the turn of the century, theories of social defense, um, such as the famous uh, book uh, of that title, uh, Social Defense, by the Belgian sociologist Adolf Prinz, and the impetus for the recurring theme that society must be defended. Of course, I'm referring to the title of Foucault's 1976 lectures at the Collège de France. In this work, Foucault uses the example of the exploitation of forests in France uh, at the end of the 18th century. He writes in his manuscript that uh, the old forests, a place of refuge, toleration, survival, not only for the marginals, but also for the poorest inhabitants who graze, take wood, and poach in it, tends to become exploitable and supervised property. Foucault mentions Marx's articles on thefts of wood and other works, those of Louis-Auguste uh, Blanqui, as necessary stepping stones to a theory of illegalisms. And like Marx, uh, Foucault criticizes the legislature at the time for pretending to represent everyone, but only promoting the interests of the wealthy. He engages in a silent dialogue with the English, French, and Soviet historians, uh, at first taking up, but then resisting the notion of seditious mobs understood not so much through the lens of the moral economy of the seditious mob, but through the lens of the control of the popular classes. You can almost hear Foucault lecturing in conversation with the historians, because it's at that, that hinge point, that pivotal point, where he introduces and starts to develop his theory of popular illegalisms, um, that he is distancing himself from the theory of seditious mobs. Um, he had originally endorsed that idea, the idea that um, uh, it was the, the political surveillance of a population uh, that involved, that, that is what triggered new repressive apparatuses. Um, so a theory of um, uh, the repression of seditious mobs is giving rise to juridical and penal institutions. He'd originally endorsed this approach as an explanation for the birth of the judicial and prison system. And that was his repressive theory of power from his study of the New Pierre Rebellion and penal theories and institutions. Um, but at this point in February 1973, Foucault departs from that view and develops instead a theory of popular illegalisms that operate in a field of struggle and are turned into illegalities in the fight over resources. The passage is really important, and I quote it in full in my written introduction, so you get a sense of the way in which the theory of illegalisms comes out of his earlier work and his engagement with uh, the historians. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll skip the long passage now, um, but basically he says, like he says, I, 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 for a time I thought it could be solved in a few words. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, um, the political surveillance of a population, of a populace that is becoming a proletariat, involves the organization of a new repressive apparatus, he says. Right? But now I'm not so sure I am right in using the term seditious mobs uh, 
And actually what I want to look at is lower class illegalisms. A brilliant passage because it's right there that you see the emergence of the concept of illegalisms in the punitive society. Now, Foucault would famously elaborate his theory of illegalisms in Discipline and Punish, both in his discussion of 18th century punishment, specifically referencing the exploitation of the forests, and in greater detail in the chapter on illegalisme et délinquance hmm, uh, at the end of the book. Um, it's translated as illegalities and delinquency. Perhaps we could translate it as illegalisms and delinquency. Um, also earlier in his discussion of generalized punishment, uh, which is a, where he's got a discussion of the development of capitalism, um, Foucault also discusses the exploitation of the forests and the question of the thefts of wood. Um, but it's in that later section, Illegalisme et délinquance, that he really develops what could be called a general economy of illegalisms. He explored in intricate detail how the penitentiary system did not so much repress or seek to eliminate illegalisms as it sought to manage them, to distribute them, to massage them in a manner to profit the more privileged. The regulation of illegalisms served to set limits, to put pressure and to exclude some, but not all, to manipulate some forms but not all, to manage social and economic relations. Foucault takes the example of sex work or commercial sex and shows how the detentions and the surveillance served to regulate an economy of sex to the benefit of the class of purveyors, a way to manage and exploit illegalisms. And of course, he places this general economy of illegalisms squarely in the field of social battle. He wrote repeatedly about le grondement de la bataille, the roar or the rumbling of battle. He wrote of confrontations and struggles, of jeu de force, struggles of power, games of force, of the roar of the battle, of a, quote, rumbling from the midst of the battlefield before, of course, ending discipline and punish on those famous words about the roar of the battlefield. In effect, Foucault proposed in Discipline and Punish a, a book-length treatment of the power struggles between the privileged and the poor, both the mechanisms of control and the forms of resistance. Discipline and Punish is a long fortin treatment of the way that capitalism used crime and punishment as a force of production. It confirms that, as Peter Leinbau wrote, Capital's most ancient tool and the, the capital's most ancient tool in the creation and control of the working class was crime and punishment. In a way, it explains why George Jackson proposed that we burn the libraries of criminology. This book is the manual that shows in intimate, intricate detail within the subjectivities of the people how capitalism functioned through penality. <clears throat> now let me turn to some of the work that this led to, <clears throat> particularly James C. Scott and the theory of infrapolitics. As noted earlier, the political theorist James C. Scott built on the edifice of Marx, Foucault, and social historians like E.P. Thompson and, and Peter Leinbau to develop a, a, a brilliant, a brilliant theory of what he called infrapolitics and ordinary acts of resistance. Scott drew specifically on Thompson's writings on the poaching struggles during the 18th century and the exploitation of the forests to underscore the intentionality of these struggles, the way in which they constituted pitched battles over resources. These were acts of resistance by the poor and subordinate, Scott emphasized, not just forms of oppression for the privileged class. They are best understood <clears throat> through the metaphor of, this is Scott, guerrilla warfare. And notice uh, guerrilla warfare <clears throat> and its um, relationship to Foucault's idea of civil war. In the context of thefts of wood, 
<clears throat> Scott described minutely how the ordinary acts of resistance would take place by concealing green wood within a bundle of dead wood or by girdling the bottom of trees <clears throat> below the, the tree line, below eyesight, uh, so that they would die and then could be gathered as dead wood. It is in this context that Scott too returns to Marx's article on the thefts of wood, drawing on Leinbau's uh, historical and sociological analysis of important proceedings, of enforcement proceedings, to show the historical variations in that guerrilla warfare. Right? Um, Scott emphasizes that although these infrapolitics appear to be minor, ordinary acts of resistance, they can be deeply consequential and that we must treat them as real politics on par with revolutionary action. The stakes are no different, and neither are the consequences. Entire armies can be defeated through acts of desertion, he says. Revolutions can be fomented by riots, or rather, maybe riots are revolutionary, as Joshua Clover demonstrates in his book, Riot, Strike, Riot. Another uh, set of uh, research pushed this in the direction of abolition. Now, in Discipline and Punish, Foucault pays special tribute to the, what he calls, great work, grand oeuvre, of the Frankfurt School penologist George Rusch and Otto Kirchheimer, authors of Punishment and Social Structures, uh, published in 1939, um, which is a classic uh, neo-Marxist text on penality, a text which shows how punishment is, is not a response to crime, but is a way of organizing labor. Foucault uh, grounds his work on the premises of Rusch and Kirchheimer, namely on the basic starting point that the study of punishment must be decoupled, decoupled from the study of the causes and consequences of crime. In other words, that we should not think of punishment as the consequence of crime, but instead search for punishment's other functions. You will recall, of course, the beginning of Discipline and Punish, uh, these famous words where Foucault writes, we must first rid ourselves of the illusion that penality is above all, if not exclusively, a means of reducing crime. We must analyze, rather, the concrete systems of punishment study them as social phenomena that cannot be accounted for by the juridical structure of society alone, nor by its fundamental ethical choices. We must situate them in their field of operation in which the punishment of crime is not the sole element. Of course, uh, Foucault could have referred as well to Marx's articles on the thefts of wood, um, which performed similar work of decoupling crime and punishment. Marx showed how punishment was instrumentalized to advance the interests of the privileged and wealthy, and that it had to be understood in relation to its functions or operations in social struggle. Marx's text on the thefts of wood, as well as Rusch and Kirchheimer's, as well as Foucault's, must be understood as forming part of a broader arc of historical and social criticism that leads to the present movement for penal abolition. This arc includes W.E.B. Du Bois' brilliant book, Black Reconstruction in America, uh, written and published in 1935, uh, which deconstructed the black codes of the antebellum period and showed how they served to reestablish a form of slavery through institutions like convict leasing and plantation prisons. The arc include Angela Davis's early writings from Marin County Jail in May 1971, in which Davis reveals the political nature of the criminal law and deconstructs the distinction between common law and political prisoners. The arc includes George Jackson's writings, Soledad Brother, and Blood in the Water, in the Eye, Blood in My Eye, which so powerfully demonstrate the political nature of the prison. Uh, Blood in the Water is, of course, <clears throat> the brilliant um, uh, book on the Attica uprising <clears throat> by Heather Thompson. The arc leads inexorably to the current movement for abolition 
led by brilliant critical theorists and organizers like Angela Davis, Miriam Kaba, Beth Ritchie, Dorothy Roberts, Derricka Purnell, Amna Akbar, Ruth Wilson, Gilmore, Jocelyn Simonson, Dean Spade, Allegra McLeod, Liat Ben Moshe, and more. The new abolitionists build on this critical tradition that deconstructed the link between crime and punishment. All the historical and theoretical work that demonstrated how the enforcement of law serves as a political device deployed by coalitions in power to reproduce and entrench social and racial hierarchy. Punishment is not merely a response to crime. It is a principal tool, weapon, tactic, or technique deployed to reproduce racial and social hierarchies. This critique of political liberalism went unheard for decades. The new abolitionist writings have finally propelled this critical insight into the mainstream. I would say that the new abolitionists represent one of the most promising developments in contemporary politics. They've been a galvanizing force in the movement for black lives and helped bring about the largest and most diverse social protests in American history. They have given birth to a global movement for racial and economic equality. And importantly, they have challenged us to confront the most central but flawed premises that ground Western political liberalism, the faulty belief in the neutrality of the criminal law, the illusion of the rule of law, the misplaced faith in law enforcement, central tenets of legalistic political liberalism that dominate our imagination in a country like the United States. This brings me back then to the question of kind of why start with Marx in 1842? Um, now, others might maintain that that's not the right place to start. Althusser maintained that these early writings reflected that Marx was still, in his words, enslaved to the dominant ideology in which he was raised. Althusser spoke of the, quote, gigantic layer of illusions he had to break through before he could even see his contingent beginnings and ideological biases. The articles in the Thefts of Wood showed glimpses of Marx liberating himself from that ideology, Althusser thought, but they revealed his youthful attachment to earlier idealist and liberal tenets. I think that fails to acknowledge the import of these articles and the remarkable work they did. In these articles, Marx severed the relation between crime and punishment and exposed the violence and brutality of class struggle. And this reminds me why I wanted to start there in 1842 with Marx's articles on thefts of wood. And not just with Hegel and Feuerbach, but with crime and punishment and material interests and class warfare. When Marx recalls that these materials confronted him with materialism, and prompted him to study political economy. That's important. It's the place to start. As Peter Leinbau writes, faced with his own Marxist and Engels' evidence regarding how these articles influenced his trajectory, we must therefore beware of those accounts of the development of Marx's ideas that see it in the exclusive terms of either the self-liberation from the problematic of left Hegelianism or the outcome of a political collision that his ideas had with the French utopian and revolutionary tradition that he met during his exile in Paris. The famous trinity, trinity, French politics, German philosophy, and English political economy of the intellectual lineages of Marx's critical analysis of the capital mode of production appears to include everything but the actual material form in which class struggle first forced itself to the attention of the young radical in 1842. At this seminar, Marx 213, we will focus primarily on Marx's 1842 articles and Foucault's work on the punitive society, his two lecture series at the Collège de France, Penal Theories and Institutions, and the Punitive Society, and his book on the prison, Discipline and Punish. For this reason, it is a 
privilege to have the philosopher Judith Revel with us at Marx 213 to discuss Foucault's reading of Marx's articles on the thefts of wood. Judith Revel is one of the world's leading authorities on Michel Foucault's thought and one of the most subtle and insightful readers of Foucault. She has written groundbreaking work on Foucault and other contemporary philosophers, including Merleau-Ponty, in works such as Foucault, Experience de la Pensée, Dictionnaire Foucault, Foucault in Pensée du Discontinu, and Foucault avec Merleau-Ponty. She has directed the Italian edition of Foucault's Dit et Écrit. And Judith will explore with us the unique way in which Foucault weaved together the analysis of penality, the analysis of penality, on the one hand, and the study of political economy and the birth of capitalism on the other. How Foucault approached the topics, from which directions, and how that will and can enrich his and our analysis. The seminar will thus proceed in two stages. Judith Revel will present for uh, 45 minutes on Foucault and illegalism and his relation to Marx. And then if there is time, I'll add a few elements on the way in which Marx's analysis in the articles and Foucault's theories of penality form part of a historical strain of thought that leads inexorably to abolition today. Welcome to 213.